For billions of years, it had been orbiting the Sun at the dark edge of the solar system. Perhaps tens of thousands of years ago, no one knows when, a close encounter altered the course of this small chunk of ice and flung it toward a new destiny and a new orbit that would bring it close to the Sun every few thousand years. On its most recent passage around the Sun, a team of astronomy enthusiasts awaited this comet's arrival with ambitious plans, a project to capture a comet on film as no one had done before. was the rather wild idea of Peter Saravolo, a Canadian astronomy enthusiast and telescope maker. The goal? To make a comet come alive. Back in the 1980s, I saw an IMAX movie called Sacred Sight. It wasn't a very long movie, only about seven minutes, full of time-lapse motion picture sequences, some with astronomical themes. And one of the, one of the segments in that, a 20-second clip, was of Comet Halley moving through the star field. To the layman, it didn't look very impressive, but to someone who understands astronomical photography, I was stunned. For the first time, I saw an object like a comet come to life, as opposed to being a static, two-dimensional thing on a photograph. The opportunity to capture a comet in time-lapse movies came in March 1996, and the close approach of Comet Hyakutake, a comet discovered only weeks earlier by Yuji Hyakutake, a Japanese amateur astronomer. Hyakutake's comet, like most, is really an orbiting iceberg. A nucleus only two kilometers across, pockmarked with jets of dust and gas that erupt into activity as the comet nears the warmth of the sun. Capturing this activity in time-lapse detail was going to be a technical challenge. No conventional camera or movie system would do the job. Instead, Peter had to draw on his optical expertise to design a special photographic system called an astrograph. The astrograph is a completely custom-designed uh, photographic telescope. Nothing about it is off the shelf, if you will, or readily available. Everything from the optics um, I designed and manufactured right through to the, the film holder. Time-lapse movies of the comet would require taking dozens of exposures every night for as many nights as possible. The result would be hundreds of negatives. But it became clear to me after not too long a time that turning those little frames, 35 millimeter frames, into a motion picture was going to be one heck of a lot of work and it required a skill set different than my own. And that's when I did my best to try and convince Doug George that he really needed to be in on this project. His programming skills, his image processing skills were indispensable in turning these still frames into a truly stunning motion picture sequence. But Peter realized he needed more than just Doug's expertise. Since Comet Yakutake was coming so close to us, I suspected it might be possible to resolve jet-like structure coming from the comet. And I suggested to Paul Boltwood that it might be a worthy project to try and produce a time-lapse motion picture of the inner workings of Comet Yakutake, trying to record the jet structure and changing features very tight into the comet's head. And we were very fortunate that he took, he took the project on. Paul Boltwood had his own technical challenges, tracking the comet from his backyard observatory. Paul planned to use a 7-inch refractor telescope to image the comet at extremely high magnification. But instead of using film, Paul planned to capture the comet electronically. Paul's project would complement the images the rest of the group hoped to take. Paul, concentrating on details near the nucleus, 
and Peter taking wider shots of changes in the tail. Comet Hyakutake would pass only 15 million kilometers above Earth's North Pole, then race off toward the Sun. The group would have only a few days to shoot the comet, one chance in a lifetime. As any astrophotographer knows, it's a meticulous process. Equipment has to be aligned with arc second accuracy. In the dark, in the cold, late at night, it's easy to make mistakes. Dawn, and what would become a familiar chore? taking down all the equipment they had so painstakingly set up hours before. It had been a successful first night. Or had it? The real proof was still in the cameras waiting to be developed. With the moon setting later each night, time for shooting the comet under a dark sky was coming to an end. They had captured the comet on 10 nights, taking over 900 photographs. But that was just the beginning. 900 negatives of the comet, and each had to be digitally scanned. The technique is a new one, combining the 150-year-old process of photography with the latest digital technology. Each negative was placed on an electronic scanner, which turned the image into digital data. Before they could be spliced into a movie, each image had to be enhanced, corrected, cleaned up. Paul had captured more than 2,000 digital images from his small backyard observatory. Weeks of planning, nights of arduous shooting, and months of work at the computer came down to one short videotape. No, this first part, I like the first part, I have to admit, that first part looks really yeah. nice. You know, up, up until the night with the clouds, you know, is the best part. And there's a there's a galaxy. So that little galaxy zooming by. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like right. Going to the tail. You can see the cloud, bright stars. Yeah. Going through the clouds. Up, they fuzz up, and yes. then, then you see a little hop as I've deleted a number of frames that are too clouded out. Oh, okay. So th that that big jump was because of the cloud, because you had to edit out yeah, the cloud. It, it must have knocked out about uh, half the night, yeah. at least. There comes the dust tail, that I like because of the color contrast with the iron tail. Y you've got many different appearances. The different nights are all different from each other. We're very lucky on that. This comet really looks like many different comets. Comets. What are those things zooming by there like that? Satellites. It's got to be satellites. I thought the satellites. I thought they might have been a meteor or something that was straight through. No, there's too many of them. They're running parallel. They're yeah. satellites. They're probably geosynchronous satellites. Well, it's amazing the differences you get the difference you when this thing is set in motion. The brilliant head glows in shades of green and cyan, colors created by molecules of carbon and cyanogen. The most striking feature is the comet's bluish tail, a gas tail waving in the wind of charged particles and magnetic fields streaming out from the sun. As the comet approached Earth, its motion across the sky sped up, making stars appear to streak across the frame faster and faster. Part way through the sequence, a broad yellowish tail appears, one made of dust particles ejected from jets on the nucleus of the comet. <laughs> yeah, here's Paul's sequence. Jets. You can you know, rotate. When did you get the jets? Just spinning around. Look wow. at the stars zipping through. Looks like it's raining. Oh, What's that just... fountain effect? But what happened yeah. to the rotation? It doesn't look like it's actually rotating. It looks like it's just blowing stuff off. Well, it's yeah. rotating in the first part. Yeah, yeah it's going now, now here, here, it's going off. Really it's about, going right off the screen. You got jets that go right yeah, off. The screen. But did you have? Did you have much cloud? But they're going this way now. Did you have much? Was there's a big, there's a big transition between here, this part that's rotating. Oh, there were. There were uh, Whole and nights that bang were there yeah. now the now the fountain. well the, the, there's a couple well, nights change a night that's more than one night though isn't it the gap? Oh, we've, we've got, yes. well, get a little of the in Paul's the high magnification nice. view probes into the bright head of the comet to reveal details in a region roughly 14,000 kilometers across 
the two kilometer wide nucleus itself is invisible, embedded in the bright glow. But spraying from the region around the nucleus are multiple jets of dust. They had achieved their goal. A group of astronomy enthusiasts had combined talents and resources to bring a comet to life. The images are beautiful, almost hypnotic to gaze at. Reward enough for the effort? Perhaps. But in a surprising turn of events, the movies were to prove to have much more than just aesthetic value. From his office in Tucson, Steve Larson explains some of the science in the images. So, Steve, these are nice, pretty pictures here, but can you uh, tell us what's going on in a very basic way with the comet and uh, what we're seeing, what's happening? Well, these time-lapse videos show graphically how comets change in time rather than still pictures. And uh, because they're color, they also show various components of the comet. You can see the head of the comet, which is gases produced by sublimating ices as it gets close to the sun, and also components caused by dust, which are blown back by radiation pressure, which are shown as kind of yellowish, and then uh, ions, which are purplish, that get driven back by the magnetic field of the solar wind. And uh, only in sequences like this can you really see the uh, subtle changes in the ions, which are traveling rather quickly. Uh, they're being accelerated back at uh, a couple hundreds of kilometers per second velocities, whereas uh, the other, uh, the dust, for example, is, is going back much uh, more slowly. For this comet, the gas tail was the showpiece. This purplish tail is made of ions, molecules of water and carbon monoxide, among others, stripped of some electrons. Like iron filings, these ions can be twisted into intricate patterns by magnetic fields. The waves and ripples we see are an effect of the comet traveling across the shifting magnetic field spiraling out from the sun. They form a visible probe of a space between the planets a celestial windsock blowing in the solar wind. Then the sequence that shows the uh, near nucleus structure is particularly interesting because this component is, the brightest part of the comet is all dust and uh, these are being given off from a rotating nucleus from discrete areas mm -hmm. and uh, so you almost get a lawn sprinkler effect uh, for the different uh, active areas as the nucleus rotates. On the first night, there is a slight clockwise rotation. But on the second night, the jets appear to be shooting straight out. The pressure of sunlight curves the dust jets back in either direction, but with little rotation. As it turned out, on the nights Paul took his images, we were looking down at the equator of the comet. Had we been looking at either of its poles, the lawn sprinkler effect would have been more obvious. Thanks. So this Yakutake provided us an excellent opportunity uh, because it was a, such a close approach. Yes. How often can we expect <clears throat> such close approach type comets to appear? No, oh, once or twice a lifetime. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's that were it. this bright. Right. Hope, hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> After rounding the sun on May the 1st, 1996, Comet Yakutake sped away. returning back to the outer solar system. Its next visit, some 14,000 years from now. Comet Yakutake turned out to be the opportunity of a lifetime. Having a comet come by so close, one that was so dynamic, so active, and having the right mix of people, having the right equipment ready at the right time, was extremely fortunate and then to have the results the images that went into making the, the movie turn out to have scientific value scientists have requested copies of the images for research purposes to study the nature of comets all in all it's been a truly rewarding experience mm -hmm.